It's a deeply polarized country, and over a year into COVID-19, thousands and thousands have died. The economy is in the throes of inflation, unemployment is rising, and recent elections have put a new administration in charge, which is no doubt going to have global implications. In case you missed the news, I'm not actually talking about the U.S., I'm talking about Iran. On Friday, Iranians elected Ibrahim Raisi as their new president. Seen as a conservative hardliner, Raisi won by a landslide 62% of the vote. But it was in an election where turnout was just under 49%, a record low for the 41-year-old Islamic Republic, which saw turnout at over 70% just four years ago. The thing is, not only were several less conservative candidates disqualified from running, many Iranians have become disillusioned with moderates and reformists across the board in that country, who since coming to office in 2013 have not been able to turn Iran around the way many had hoped. But the new president is it isn't exactly the kind of leader the West is overjoyed to work with. For one thing, Raisi, who heads Iran's judiciary, was put under sanctions by Donald Trump in 2019 after the US tore up the Iran nuclear deal. According to the Trump administration, part of the reason was because in 1988, as the Tehran deputy prosecutor, Raisi was accused of allegedly overseeing the extrajudicial executions of thousands of political prisoners, including some alleged terrorists. But a clear lack of due process in their trials has been cause for international condemnation ever since, and particularly over Raisi's alleged role in all of that. The day after he was elected, Amnesty International issued a statement calling for the new Iranian president-elect to be investigated for crimes against humanity. A conservative hardliner he may be when it comes to US-Iran relations, but it's worth pointing out that Raisi supports the 2015 nuclear deal negotiated by Obama and co, meaning he's more willing to negotiate and engage in diplomacy than even our own conservative hardliners on Capitol Hill. The latest round of Vienna talks between Iran and the US and others resumed on Sunday. And while no one knows how long each side will continue negotiating, Raisi said in his first televised address, we will not allow negotiations to be for negotiation's sake and that results-oriented talks were important for them. But one talk that won't be happening is between Raisi and President Biden. Neither president has plans to meet, the, has plans to meet with the other. But does that matter? if a deal between the two countries is struck. Joining me now to discuss this is Washington Post opinion writer Jason Rezaian. Jason was also the Tehran bureau chief for the Post from 2012 to 2016, a period of which, 544 days to be exact, he was imprisoned by the Iranian government on espionage charges and released in 2016 as part of the nuclear deal agreement. Jason, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. You wrote in your latest op-ed for the Post that Ibrahim Raisi is the most repressive figure to ever hold the position of Iranian president. There's still six weeks before he's sworn into office. What do you think his presidency will mean for Iran once he is sworn? I mean, this is a country that had Mahmoud Ahmadinejad as a president not so long ago. Well, thanks for having me on, Matthew. It's an important time in Iranian politics. I think that uh, that Raisi's uh, election and, and coming to more prominence is not going to be a good thing for, for anybody in Iran. Uh, as you indicated in the intro, uh, this is not somebody who is known for uh, for being very diplomatic. Although, of course, you know everybody in the Iranian system realizes that negotiating this this deal uh, over their nuclear program. Uh, is of a core importance to the survival uh, of the Islamic Republic uh, moving forward. So I, I think you know, you're going to see a lot of the same people who've been involved in negotiations over the last few years sticking in their positions because Raisi simply does not have political allies that have the kind of international clout or experience or ability to even sit down with, with American and European negotiators. I think that, that the idea that he was kind of preordained for this and the scales were tipped uh, so heavily so that ensuring that he would become president uh, will turn out to be a, a massive mistake and, and one more um, bit of hubris in the long history uh, of this regime. Jason, there's no doubt that Raisi is ultra-conservative. He's a close ally of the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, but he does support the nuclear deal. Uh, which is more than uh, many conservatives uh, here do. Uh, do you think we may see a nuclear deal come through even in the next few weeks before race is sworn in, given what's going on in Vienna right now? Yeah, my guess is they're going to come to some kind of conclusion on this over the next few weeks. I think uh, the election result sort of inspires uh, both sides, the, the U.S. and the Iranian negotiators, to, to really uh, pick up the pace and try to get this thing done 
uh, in the next four or five weeks because it'll become more difficult. Raisi's already said he'll keep some of those negotiators uh, in place. Uh, but I think that there really is a, a desire to get it done as quickly as possible. And, and you know, from where I'm sitting as somebody who, who was a former prisoner uh, in Iran, there's four Americans being held uh, at this very moment. And I think that the prospects for their release will diminish greatly once uh, Raisi comes into, uh, into office. So I'm hoping that, that a deal for their release is being negotiated right now. It's a very good point, and we can only hope. Uh, Jason, isn't part of the problem here that hawks in the U.S., Iran hawks, keep getting new sanctions imposed on Iran, whether under Obama, whether under Trump. Joe Biden hasn't made any commitment to lifting certain sanctions. These sanctions, let's be clear, have devastated life in Iran. Unemployment, inflation, the ability to get medical equipment, all affected by sanctions, especially during a pandemic. It's been awful. And the sanctions, of course, undermine the moderates who are in office, or the pragmatists, the Rouhani's, the Zarif's, who can't really get anything done with their hands tied, can't improve the economy, which is what the people who voted for them wants. They then get voted out, as we've just seen. You get a conservative come in like Raisi, which the hawks in America then point to and say, see, there's no one to negotiate with. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy for them. That's exactly right. It's a vicious cycle that's been going on for a long time. As you mentioned earlier, uh, we got Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in 2005 for a lot of the same reasons. You know, Iranians were disenchanted by the, the eight years of reformist president, Mohammad Khatami, uh, who promised a lot and wasn't able to deliver. I think Rouhani promised a lot more and delivered even less. Uh, and, and a big part of that was because of the sanctions that straddled Iran's economy for, for these last eight years. Um, and, and more specifically over the last three years since, since the U.S. left the deal under Trump. I think that ultimately, um, you know, the Iranian regime is responsible for caring for the Iranian people and finding ways around it. Uh, I'm no fan of sanctions, and I know a lot of people who have been devastated by these. And I, 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 I've often argued uh, for the lifting of economic sanctions. But I think we're entering an era where there might be actually a lot of uh, personalized sanctions against people like Raisi and others uh, for their past uh, crimes, really. I mean, there's, there's no other way to describe it. So, you know, it's, it's a bad moment. Uh, in the in the in the history of relations, and as he indicated, the the hardliners in in our own Congress, especially here in the U.S., are not going to make it any easier for Biden uh, to open up pathways of, of of engagement. So, so you mentioned what's happening here. I mean, here in the U.S., you have Iran hawks now openly advocating for regime change in Tehran, with former U.S. State and Defense Department officials writing that for regime change in Iran, the U.S. should use every instrument at its disposal to undermine Iran's clerical state, including covert assistance to dissidents. That's in foreign affairs. And then you have the new Israeli prime minister, Naftali Bennett, calling Raisi a hangman and warning world powers against joining a deal a nuclear deal with him. How worried are you that a war with Iran could be what ends up happening in the coming years, if not wittingly, then unwittingly? Well, I think with the departure of, of Benjamin Netanyahu in, in Israel, um, it's less likely than it was you know, a few weeks back. Uh, there are people here in Washington gunning for it and have been for a very long time. Um, but I think that it's in nobody's interest for us to stumble into or actively try and get into a war with Iran. I read these comments about, you know, the moment is ripe for regime change in Iran. I agree that at this moment, uh, the popularity of, of the Islamic Republic has never been lower. There's more dissent and tension in that country than perhaps there's ever been in the last 42 years. But I don't see any indication that that uh, the regime is about to cr crumble under the weight of of uh, honestly, a lot of pressure from the outside. So, you know, I, I think we're going to have to come to terms with them on some things. And, you know, the the idea of blocking them from getting a nu nuclear weapons capability was a good idea. And it's a better idea now with the new government. Uh, last question, Jason. In 2014, you were held in prison in Iran for almost two years. The government said it was for espionage and propaganda. You, of course, have maintained your in innocence throughout. What has it been like watching all that's happened in Iran from afar since you got out, since you came back to the United States? Do you, I mean, I'm assuming you can't go back. What do you make no. of what's happening in Iran, not just as an analyst, but as an Iranian-American, as a former prisoner in that country? Well, it's a, it's a great question, Mehdi, and I appreciate you for asking it. You know, I love that country very much. I have a lot of fond memories and people that I care about who 
uh, continue to live there and many of them are suffering. Uh, it, it's hard to, to watch from afar and try and make sense of uh, what's happening there. Uh, there are a lot of people here in, in DC and uh, you know in the media with far less experience of, of Iran uh, than I have who are much more certain of their uh, assumptions about what goes on there. Um, I hope that there's a day that I can go back, but you know that'll be at a time when a, a new government is in place, a new system entirely, because I don't think it's a safe place for me or my wife to go to at this point. No, I would advise against booking any trips to Iran anytime soon, Jason. Uh, but we're glad you're safe and well, and and <laughs> we're glad you're back in the United States. We're glad you took time out to come on the show tonight and talk to us uh, about an important uh, story in the world of politics today. Appreciate it, Jason. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.